so you should see the permission this pop up. Is being recorded. Okay, so welcome everyone. I see some new faces. Howard! Sorry, just got very excited to see you, my friend. So good, Craig, you've got, uh, you've yes, got some firepower with you. I forgot to mention Howard was going to be joining us today. Great, I'm so pleased. Howard, we can't hear you, or at least I cannot. hear you, at least I can see. want to look at your <laughs> audio your settings head. there. Um, so, get rid of that. So welcome everyone. Uh, it's insane seeing some new faces, which is terrific. Glad to have people joining us in. So this is a, a meeting for those who don't meeting know, those who don't know, which we hold every we month. Hold every month. And I'm going to ask somebody to ask somebody move here. To move here. I'm getting some feedback. Um, um, so we so hold this meeting. We hold for, this meeting. For, it was for, originally for grand grand upholding rule of law or wrongful conviction review program from the Bureau of Justice Administration. But it was so popular that we really opened it up to anybody who was engaged in post-conviction investigation, prosecution, and in innocence organization defense counsel. We welcome everybody to this. We try to share information which we think is helpful for folks who are engaged in this work. Um, this month, I'm very pleased and, and very, very happy to have with us folks from the Suffolk County District Attorney's Office in New York, one present, one former as well as two members from of staff from the New York Law School Post-Conviction Innocence Clinic. Uh, what we're gonna be talking about today are conducting audits of cases. This is an issue that we at the Quattrone Center see quite a bit of the district attorneys in particular who want to, are interested in conducting audits of cases uh, for cases of misconduct, cases of potential forensic error, or other issues. Well, the Suffolk County District Attorney's Office took on that role and did exactly that. Uh, coming out with a report that was released in December of last year. So we're going to talk today with the folks who put that report together, uh, Craig McElwee and Howard Master, who are with the Suffolk County District Attorney's Office Conviction Integrity Bureau. But we're also going to bring into the discussion Gaynor um, Cunningham, excuse me, and Adele Bernhardt from the New York Law School Post-Conviction Innocent Clinic, because they actually participated with the CIB in, in, in reviewing the report finalizing the report for its publication and are involved in some of the cases post review. So, <clears throat> excuse me, as always, we encourage people to have their cameras on so that you know, we can see faces as we're talking and, and discussing these issues with you. And we always prefer folks to give feedback, ask questions, um, let us know what you're thinking as we go through. You can put it in the chat, you can raise your little hand on the Zoom. If you raise your physical hand, um, we'll try to find you, but it is a little difficult with so many folks on the call. Um, and I apologize, I should have done this earlier. Also wanted to um, introduce and say hi to Kia Hayes, my colleague at the Quattrone Center. Hey, Kia. Hi, hi everyone. So Kia is holding down the fort at the office um, for us. I'm here at home living the COVID life. So um, with all that, I want to get started. So I'm going to go ahead and uh, highlight Howard and Craig for us. Let me find where Craig, there you are. Oh. Okay, so hopefully folks are seeing them. So I want to kind of, if it's okay with you, Craig and Howard, give a little bit of background about the report. Um, as I said, it's in the chat, you can download it for yourselves. Um, the first few, I'd say probably eight pages is the review, is the, the summary of the cases and why it, the review is necessary. But I think it's important to kind of give some background for this. So, and Craig and Howard, please correct me when I say something wrong. Uh, so this is an audit of cases by a particular prosecutor who was at the Suffolk County District Attorney's Office. There was one case in particular where he was prosecuting a gentleman named Booker, where the case actually fell apart mid trial because there was an allegation and it was proven that the district attorney did not turn over information that it should have been turned over under Brady Giglio, but also under the New York's uh, case law and interpretation of Rosario. And in fact, during the trial, mid-trial, the district attorney was replaced by another prosecutor within the office. The case broke down um, in that the uh, person who was on trial was offered a negotiated plea because of what had happened during that trial. That case in the, of, of one went to the, and Craig, correct me if I'm wrong here, so this is the, the grievance committee, I'm assuming, of the Bar Association for New York or the disciplinary process in New York, and they actually conducted a review of the case, filed a petition against the district attorney, the district attorney answered, 
and they came out with their recommendations, which was then um, adopted by the court, I think in December 2020. The result of the case was that the district attorney was suspended for two years. He was not disbarred, however, be partly because, as I read the opinion, the grievance committee found that this was a one-off, that there was no evidence of any additional cases where this prosecutor had engaged in similar misconduct. Although they did find the misconduct to be egregious, they also found um, in mitigation that he hadn't done it before, that he had a good character, and there were other mitigating factors that led it only to his two-year suspension. As I understand, that district attorney resigned from the Suffolk County District Attorney's Office, and kind of in the meantime, as there was a new election, a new district attorney took office, the DA Seeming, and she decided to um, pursue this case with the newly created Conviction Integrity Bureau. And that bureau then took on two questions. One, has any other defendant gone through this situation where it affected their due, their due process rights at trial? And two, should they, uh, was there evidence that they should send up to the grievance committee for their consideration against that fact of the finding that there had only been this one case, there were no other um, cases of misconduct for this particular district attorney. So that's, I think, the background of the report. Craig Fowler, did I handle that okay? Yeah, she handled that just fine. I, I know Correct. anything and everything that I just said wrong. Yeah. No, uh, the, the taking over in mid trial was more of a taking over at the end of the trial by the uh, chief of the bureau to for the purpose of pleading the case out once everything was discovered and the judge became enraged with everything that was going on. The, uh, the prosecutor was basically removed from the case, his bureau chief took over um, and basically pled the case out at that point, uh, handling the record and the ADA then about an hour and a half after that took place, handed in his resignation. There you go. Fast moving events, indeed. So one thing that we want to look at today, um, so once the, the CIB then got that charge, they actually reviewed every case this district attorney had handled as a prosecutor, both at trial and where they had worked on pretrial, looking for whether there was any other elements of misconduct. Um, so it is essentially an audit of the cases that this DA handled. And I will we'll discuss in some moments what the findings that report were. But what we're going to cover today are kind of a lot of broad questions. You know, why did the CIB take on this duty of looking at other cases? What kind of obstacles got in their way of trying to find the cases? How did they identify them, find them, get them to review? What, how, what was the process in actually reviewing those cases? And you'll hear there were some um, issues of conflicts with the dir director of the bureau himself, Craig, um, in terms of his handling of some of the cases when, as a defense counsel, and then why decide to get the New York Law School involved and how that happened. And then, of course, we'll bring Adele and Gaynor into the conversation so they can kind of explain from their end how that partnership worked. So I'm going to start with um, Howard and Craig. We're going to run this kind of as a moderated discussion, if you will. Um, but for either or both, so what prompted DA Cini to kind of take this broad look? It would have been fairly easy for that administration to kind of just say, well, he's gone, we're done. Why actually decide to dig in and take on this responsibility? Howard, you can go. You started. Yeah, I'll right. Exactly. I, I, I was, uh, I guess I was the, the founding uh, chief of the Conviction Integrity Bureau when uh, D.A. Sini um, made his pronouncement that, th that we would be looking at uh, Kurtz Rock's prior cases. So I, I guess I can speak to that, Craig. Uh, later became chief of the Conviction Integrity Bureau and was supervising the bureau when we ultimately issued the report. But um, the decision to review Kurtz Rock's cases and publicly report on it um, actually fo it followed his resignation but preceded the disciplinary action. Um, and the reason for it was that, uh, th that we were aware not only of the collapse of the Booker case, but of uh, very serious problems that uh, had been identified in another case involving someone named Sean Lawrence, uh, who ultimately uh, D.A. Um, uh, decided uh, not to further prosecute. He had been convicted of murder and sentenced to 75 years in prison. Uh, and uh, again, had a, a, an initial review 
of that case that followed Kurtz Rock's uh, resignation actually revealed uh, similar egregious Brady violations, uh, Jiglio violations, and violations of uh, one in New York State is Rosario, basically the, the, the pretrial production of prior statements of testifying witnesses. So uh, we knew that there was a problem that was not, not a one-off, and uh, we wanted to both assure ourselves that, uh, that uh, the, the conduct that he had engaged in in those two cases didn't taint other prosecutions, or if they did, that uh, remedies could be um, you know, made available to those people, or at minimum, um, information could be provided to those uh, defendants that, that had not been produced, that should have been produced, so that they could make their own decisions about what remedies to seek. And then um, because the uh, resignation of Kurtz Rock uh, was very well publicized, uh, and there had been a lot of concern from the bar about the ethics, not only of Glenn Kurtz Rock, but of the office as a whole. Um, because the, the, the prior district attorney actually had been indicted and um, ultimately was convicted and sentenced to substantial term imprisonment in federal court for obstructing justice in a case involving police misconduct. Uh, there was, uh, there was you know, a, ample reason, I think, for the DA to say, well, we're not only going to uh, do this work, but we're going to tell the public about what we've done. Uh, just to show that there's there's accountability. And I'll, I'll let Craig take it from there about the actual work of preparing the report and doing the analysis. Right, and I want to actually kind of highlight that last part that you mentioned, Howard, about the accountability aspect of that, right? I mean, this is, um, it's a pretty substantial report. It's very clearly aimed at public consumption. Um, why was that such a priority for DA Sini in going, why not just do an internal review and take internal action? Well, I think because there was a you know question of public trust and confidence in the office, uh, given both Kurtz Rock's uh, well publicized violations and you know the the violations that had occurred at the very top of the organization previously, I think there was a lot of question from the bar, the press, um, and the public more generally about whether the office was you know committed to actually achieving justice or instead was just interested in you know achieving convictions or covering up police misconduct and that was one of the reasons why da Sini, you know decided he needed to create a conviction integrity bureau in the first place um obviously it's happening all over the country but it was urgent uh, in his view that it be created in suffolk county given the history uh in in the county and adele actually i think can and Craig um, uh, can speak to the history, which is fairly sordid, um, you know, of, of police misconduct and and um, DA's office uh, covers covering up of that misconduct. And I will ask Adele to cover that later. So Adele, just be warned, forewarned, I'm going to be coming back to you for that kind of information. But um, so Craig, can you pick it up from? where Howard was saying in terms of the decision to do this report and what was behind the and just just yeah to, to piggyback off of in regard to the internal you know doing something internally an in internal investigation actually in 2017 I believe eight of Kurtz Rock's homicide trials were pulled and they were assigned to senior ADAs and there was an internal review done those internal reviews resulted in memorandums being given to Emily Constant who was the acting district attorney at the time after uh, Tom Spoda resigned after being federally indicted. Um, and those internal memorandum came to a conclusion that while there were violations or items that definitely should have been turned over, that they didn't feel they adversely affected the verdict, um, certain items were turned over to defense counsel and basically life went on. Um, obviously our review was a much more comprehensive review brought into all those things. And it was, I think it was very important um, based upon the general attitude uh, in, in our community and outside of our community, that it be public and that it be made public and the public be brought into the, the thought process and the conclusions of the district attorney's office and the fact that we were doing everything we could, first of all, to make those things right and to make sure that those things never happened again. Um, so that's why I think, again, not climbing into 
EAC in his mind, but I think that was something that definitely was at the forefront of his thought, establishing a new way of looking at the district attorney's office after years of, of it definitely being viewed in a different light. Uh -huh. um, I spent 14 years, I spent years here as a prosecutor, 14 years as a defense attorney, um, doing multiple homicide uh, trials against people, including Kurt Rock, including his supervisors. Um, and there was definitely always the feeling that you were never getting everything that you should have and that the world was against you. So within the legal community, I think this was important and the community at large, I think it was important. Our jumping off part point, me and Howard, we began with those eight uh, reviews. We took those, we took those cases. We did a more comprehensive review of those cases. Um, actually in one of those cases, 163 pages of Rosario materials that weren't turned over, were turned over by the prior uh, reviewer in 2017. In 2021, we turned over another 151 pages that we found based upon our review. Um, that case is now, of course, being appealed by the defense attorney who was who also took on the appeal. Um, and also that review led to additional materials and other cases that were related to the investigation. Uh, but those, that was the jumping off point. And once Howard and I saw what was going on in those eight cases, we, we conferenced and decided that, you know what, this doesn't only have to do with murder or homicide cases. This guy was in our major crime bureau, which many people call different things, but it's basically our felony bureau where you handle burglaries and robberies and rapes and everything else. So we pulled a, to a total of 22 of his cases and, and conducted, um, you know, depending on the case, depending on the facts, depending on how they were disposed of, you know, uh, some of them were extremely in-depth and some of them were less in-depth, but still much more comprehensive than anything that anyone had ever done before. And hey, let me um, just kind of pause for a moment there. You mentioned that there were, I think you said 20 cases or some that you pulled. How did you identify the cases? I mean, it's one thing to kind of say, we want to pull all these cases that the prosecutor handled, but how did you actually find out what cases had he been a part of? Sure. Well, the office has, has a system by which they have who was assigned to those cases. The first series of cases that we pulled were ones where Glenn Kurtzrock was actually the trial attorney. He handled the trial at the time of trial, and we pulled those. Um, from that, we also then looked into certain cases where the, tri the case, the actual case had been reassigned or it had been re reassigned to him at a certain point. Um, so we knew the two bureaus he had been in, which were the Major Crime Bureau and the Homicide Bureau. And we simply pulled the cases that either had gone to hearings or trial that had Glenn Kurtzrock's name assigned to them. These weren't ones where there were reports of any wrongdoing or anything, just every single one of the cases that went to trial. And as you can see from the statistics that Howard put together, 100% of the cases had uh, things in his homicide, and I think a total of 76% um, of all of the cases that he ever tried with our, case, our, our office had issues with uh, materials that were not turned over that either should have been or were definitely at least questionable. We will probably go back to that statistic a few times during this discussion, but I want to kind of just back up even a little bit more, again, on that question of how. So, um, Am I correct that the Suffolk County District Attorney's Office has a database of sorts where you can find out and you know tell me all the cases that ADA Kutrock handled and you'll get a definitive list? Is that the way you have it? Okay. So you realize how rare that is, right? Or how special. There are a lot of offices uh, for folks who are on this call that don't have that ability to do that. If you hadn't had that, would you have been able to do this report in the same manner? Well, yeah, you know, well, we Obviously, we would have been able to do the report, I, especially with his trial cases. We would have had to go back through probably every trial that was conducted over the period of time he was employed with our office, and the court records would indicate who actually was the prosecutor who handled that trial. Uh, we could also go through the hearing, uh, the hearing records as well. Our Homicide Bureau, I think the most prosecutors we've had in the Homicide Bureau is, is six, and then a chief and a deputy chief or just a chief. So it's kind of easier to, to pin those down. Our major crime bureau is, you know, 22 to oh. 30 prosecutors. So it would have been much more difficult to go with the, the older cases that he handled. And Howard, what does that mean from your perspective to pull the cases? What are you going to get physical files with the digital materials? What did that actually mean for you in terms of getting that information together? So that was really the, 
I guess the first decision we had to make, um, you know, how, how far were we going to go, what were we going to do in order to actually be able to perform this audit effectively. And, you know, I, I, we, we knew um, fairly early on that we would want to involve the post-conviction innocence clinic as well at some stage of the review. Um, but, you know, our initial decisions were, how do we treat this potentially the same as or differently from a conviction integrity uh, case that comes in the door as an application? Um, and I guess initially we realized that we didn't, we had different objectives here. It wasn't necessarily to see if there was a wrongful conviction. Um, and we weren't, because of the volume of cases that we were looking at, we weren't going to, and, and, and also, number one, the volume, number two, the fact that our reviews were going to be conducted in most cases without any input from the defendant. So there's no application making specific allegations of misconduct or of innocence or of, uh, of anything of the sort. So we realized that our objective was essentially to audit for compliance with disclosure obligations and to remedy any uh, clear or potential disclosure violations that we identified by producing the material that or information in, in one case I, I think there was one case where um, there was an indication that you know a witness had maybe received a, a reward from our crime stoppers which is the uh, you know, I, I don't know if that's a national program, but in New York State, at least, it's uh, it's a hotline that, or in a website where you can report information, and if it turns out to be good information, you might get a financial reward. Well, anyway, we we ended up learning that this witness had, in fact, gotten a two thousand dollar reward, and so we just wrote a letter explaining that that that's what happened, and that had not been disclosed at the time of trial that he had been essentially paid for the information that he was testifying about. So um, I'm correct, this did not involve investigations, as you said, the way maybe a more typical CID case where you weren't interviewing witnesses or doing anything that nature. It was more of a record review. Right. Well, in that particular case, we actually had to reach out to Crime Stoppers to figure some information out that was indicated by the record, but not within the record that we mm -hmm. had. But even that step, just to, you know, for the benefit of other conviction integrity units uh they're here or innocence organizations that are you know seeking uh some sort of systemic or systematic r review of a particular pro uh, uh, police officers or prosecutors um work um even even that level of uh of work was extremely substantial because to again to understand whether something in the file uh, should have been disclosed, but was not. Just to answer those questions, you need to understand what the case was about, um, what was disclosed, and the records of what was disclosed are not always clear. Sometimes there was a discovery letter and attachments and a Rosario production with attachments. But, you know, as anyone who's been a trial lawyer knows, sometimes there are mid trial revelations and mid trial productions and, um, or productions in some conference prior to trial. And so we had to understand the entire essentially trial and hearing record, records of everything that was turned over. And then we needed to compare that to the remainder of the file and figure out if, you know, based on what was at issue in the case, who testified, whether there was cross examination uh, on certain points, um, what the defense was whether there was some material that was located in the file that you know was was uh, relevant to the proceeding either because it was inculpatory exculpatory or impeaching or it was just a prior statement of a testifying witness um, it should have been turned over under those uh, legal rules and so just to look at the that record for purposes of an audit was you know in, a, in the case of a homicide trial a very substantial undertaking no doubt um, and Craig, you were conflicted out of a number of these cases, so you weren't able to participate, as I understand. So, um, but I guess I'm, I'm kind of going to push back a little bit, Howard. You have prosecutors who are reviewing the file. You know, we all know about um, you know, issues of unconscious bias and confirmatory bias. How did you check against that 
as prosecutors of potentially discounting evidence that you, know, you didn't view as exculpatory or may not have been viewed as exculpatory um, without having a defense counsel at the table with you to do the review. Um, well, I guess there's always that that risk, but um, we, you know, we made sure. First of all, some of these cases had been reviewed twice, and many of the homi- uh, you know, many of the homicide prosecutions had been reviewed in 2017 by prosecutors who had no prior involvement in the cases. And then uh, when we conducted our reviews, uh, we had no prior involvement in the case and weren't part of that prior administration. Um, had never served with Glenn Kurtz Rock and had no interest in, you know, uh, in shielding uh, him or or anything having to do with him. In fact, the the opposite. The goal was let's just make sure that anything that arguably should have been turned over is turned over, so that there there can't be, you know, a later challenge to the legitimacy of this whole enterprise. Um, but you know, as part of a sort of a quality check, I think we we. We did have uh, the post-conviction innocence clinic take a look at our reports, and um, you know, uh, I, I think ultimately it turned out because of the level of effort required to conduct this this file review and the other work we're doing under our uh, under the federal grant funded partnership, it didn't make sense to have that the clinic do its own third review of all those all the files. Um, but again, they effectively audited our audit or were able to ask questions about, you know, uh, whether certain things that arguably should or shouldn't have been turned over should be turned over. Um, and I'll let them speak to that. Okay. Um, and Kia, I'm going to see that you've got your hand up if you want to jump. Yeah, thanks, Marissa. Um, I guess before we get to the Innocence Clinic, I think it might be helpful um, for the group to hear, um, were there any areas where there were where maybe the team wasn't on the same page, um, where there were some discussions that had to happen in order to to get everyone to agree with maybe the scope and the direction of of the review? Um, you know, without you know naming any names, I mean, is there any uh, any things you could share that kind of had to be um, d- discussed? You know, more deeply. I mean, I'll, I'll just start, and Craig, you can jump in, and of course, Adele and Gaynor can jump in. I think one issue is, you know, how to, how, how broad to go. I think there are, there are open questions as to whether this is a Glenn Kurtzrock issue or whether this is a problem that crossed, you know, that, that was common, not just to Kurtzrock, but to others in the Homicide Bureau. Uh, and you know whether the cult, the management culture, um, and the culture of the office as a whole, contributed to this conduct. I, I imagine that I know Craig has personal experience and uh, um, you know ha- has some concerns about some other prosecutors who have not received the same level of scrutiny. So I think there was a scope question, and and um, you know, I, but I think we we decided to start it off with. Kurtz Rock, and uh, I think there was some agreed upon language that we put in the report about the possibility of, first of all, expanding the 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 audit in a, uh, you know in the future, and at minimum, looking for issues that were identified in the report in cases that are presented to us by application. So I think that was that's one example. Craig, I don't know if you have further thoughts on that particular issue or um, or other areas where we had a you know had to resolve disagreements uh, just in regards to the whole the, everything even in regard to the prior question you asked about confirmation bias and such I think that's a very important reason why the the, the makeup of your unit and the people that are assisting you is important the fact that you know Howard comes from a certain background and I come from a background where I have four years as a prosecutor in Florida, eight years as a prosecutor in New York, 14 years as a defense attorney in in New York. I mean, that that perspective and those differences in perspective really, really do help when you are going through these discussions as to what certain things may or may not mean. Um, And and often, very often my specific knowledge of Suffolk County, Howard came in from outside of Suffolk County um, with the new administration. I had been here for 20 or 22 years 
Um, so he knew the way certain judges act and certain attorneys acted. And also, as he said, one of our discussions, and again, it wasn't a disagreement so much, was the senior staff and supervisory staff in the Homicide Bureau over the past 20 years. Um, I mean, some of those people are now judges, some of those people were judges, some of those people are now deceased, but, but there, there's definitely a theme um, that runs that I feel that Hertz Rock basically was the end result of that. And I, I don't think, I don't see based upon my review of cases that are from the eighties all the way up until now, I, I don't see the, the egregious nature of the violations that I saw in Hertz Rock's cases, but I did see the growth from his first major crime case where I saw absolutely no violations, where he turned everything over, redacted absolutely nothing um, to the case that resulted in his dismissal or resignation from the office. It was steps that, that were obviously, obvious if you look at it, literally year to year, case to case, you can see how that envelope got pushed and pushed and pushed and that people accepted it and that judges, and I spoke about this with uh, Marissa the other day when we talked about it, they look for ways to defend the conviction as opposed to looking at it from an outside perspective, which is what Howard and I absolutely did. You know, we, we looked at it from, a lack of a better term, from above, as if we were not involved at all in it. And our interests obviously were very much trying to repair the reputation of the district attorney's office. And if that resulted in showing that this was an outlier and this is one thing, look, here's all of his other stuff where he didn't make any mistakes but we had no special interest in that. The only thing that really we did was get how far to go with the people. And also in certain cases, I obviously was a defense attorney, I think in either four or five of these matters. And there was one where Howard was reviewing and I didn't like the language he used, but I really feel I was, it was my baby and he was not being nice enough to my baby for lack of a better term. But other than that, I mean, really most of the stuff was you know, just us collaborating on the effort. And when we had outside people that went into it, we spoke to the people that had done the prior reviews, um, questioned them about how they came to certain conclusions. And, and for the most part, every single person that we spoke to was very cooperative with the investigation. They all were interested in repairing what had been damaged by the actions of Glenn Kirchhoff. And I'm gonna bring in, um... Gainer and Adele in just a moment, but there's a question in the chat from Nancy Vici from Cook County about was there a motive developed um, as to why um, this particular district attorney would engage in this kind of behavior? And I think that you may have touched on it, Craig, in terms of talking about kind of an escalation from you know, kind of nothing or even potentially a culture issue. But you know, from your findings or what you think, was this kind of an individual wanting to put his finger on the scale for a particular case? Was this a culture issue, maybe a combination, lack of oversight? What do you think was kind of, what did you conclude reviewing these cases as to the motivation or how did this happen? As with everything, I think it's a combination of all of the things that you mentioned and Howard can uh, jump in if he disagrees with any of this, but I really see that the pattern that I saw was when he, he did something, which maybe he, did, he didn't do it intentionally, maybe he left something out, maybe he redacted something that was questionable as to whether he should have, and he got away with it. He saw he could get away with it, and then it built on itself. The supervision was, you know, the best thing is the, the, the interview of, of his chief. Um, her response was that, well, by the time they make it to my bureau, I don't think they need to be babysat. I figure they know what they're doing. So the supervision was, was absent. And, and when in one of my cases uh, where it was discovered that he hadn't turned over statements of co-defendants who were indicted along with him, where those two co-defendants named somebody else as the potential murderer in the case. Um, and his defense that was, well, I never intended to try them together. So they weren't co-defendants, blah, 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 for the purposes of Rosario. She actually came down to the courtroom and defended his point of view to the judge, who the, and her explanation was those two individuals, their statements were investigated by the detective, found to be incredible, and therefore they were not material, the misidentification of it. So on the record, the judge came to the conclusion that while it seemed to be Brady and everything about it was Brady, it was merely investigative and therefore not material. Makes no sense at all, but a judge actually has that. I have the record. That was his decision. 
uh -huh. that are investigative and therefore not material. So, I mean, the whole thing, the whole environment, the whole culture of not only the DA's office, but the, the criminal justice system yeah. in the county and perhaps elsewhere kind of led him to believe that he was right and everyone else was wrong. And as long as he got away with it, it was okay. So, I mean, I might be letting him off a little easy by saying, you know, well, everyone else told me that what I was doing was okay. It's okay. He also gave a statement. I'm, I'm actually leading to Howard like this, like he's really next to me, but he actually made a statement when interviewed um, that he left it up to the police to let him know if there were any Brady information. And therefore he didn't analyze the things that he put aside that weren't Rosario to see if there was Brady present. He depended on the police to let him know if there was Brady information, which I, hopefully to everyone here sounds completely insane, but he felt comfortable enough to say that to the people that were investigating whether or not he was gonna have a law license. So, so I think this answers the next question that's in the chat, which was um, whether you, this was a determination about the ADA's mens rea, either kind of overall or case by case, but it sounds like this was kind of a progression over time. And as you said before, he just kind of thought he could get away with it. And once he did, that kind of domino effect, I guess, led forward. Howard, is that reflective of what you all found? Yeah, I think so. I mean, I think uh, it looks like over time, he, um, he strayed further and further from uh, the requirements of the law. And anytime he was challenged, it seems like he was, you know, backed up by the, by the judges. Uh -huh. um, and, you know, I wouldn't say that it was a uniform practice in the Bureau. In fact, the case that Craig is talking about where he was the defense attorney, um, the, the ADA who took over uh, for trial saw this problem and was horrified by it and uh, turned everything over and in fact allowed uh, Craig to question the detectives about the statements and effectively read the statements into the record. And she said she just couldn't, it didn't make any sense to her that he would take this uh, absurd position. Um, and it seemed to her wrong and, and unethical. And, and she asked him about it and he basically said, well, that's how I read the rule. So, you know, too bad. I want to um, bring in Adele and Gaynor now. Let me just kind of get the spotlights with them as well. Um, let me find you, Gaynor, where you went. There you are. So we've been talking kind of uh, in a little bit about the federal grant, like uh, Howard and Craig both mentioned that quite a bit, um, <clears throat> and wanting to bring in the Post-Conviction Innocence Clinic as part of this um, endeavor. So I, if you could tell us a bit about what grant we're talking about, what is that? What is what was the goals of the grant or what are the what are you trying to accomplish with that? And I'm going to ask Adele and Gaynor to talk about it from that perspective. And then we'll get dive into a little bit about your involvement on this particular report. So I don't know, Adele, Gaynor, whoever wants to. OK, sure. I'll just give a, a two second background on this. Um, Howard and I worked together on a case where um, this office ended up exonerating one of the clinic's clients. And it was, I guess, one of the first cases that came into the new CIB. And Federal data found that states have over five billion dollars. Can you can you hear me? I hear something else here. Give me one second. Go ahead. Sorry about that, Adele. Okay. Yeah. There's. I apologize. Also, there's background noise in my house because there's sort of a lot going on here today. So I just screen it out because I, I can't screen it out for you. But in any event. Howard and I worked together on this exoneration and it was this very successful collaboration that we both uh, felt quite good about and thought that, you know, he, his office had done a terrific job reinvestigating it and I was, you know, it was just a very satisfactory experience. And so at around that same time, the federal government had decided to give out some of their wrongful conviction money that they had been giving to innocence projects across the country to continue to do reinvestigation of old cases looking for innocence, uh, wrongly convicted individuals. They had decided to give to 
collaborative effort. So there was, it was available. There was money available, not a whole lot, and not to too many different um, organizations, but there was money available for uh, innocence projects and district attorney's offices to work together. So Howard suggested, you know, that maybe we apply this grant. We did. The focus, obviously, of the grant is mostly to look at um, the applications which have come into the Suffolk County District Attorney's Office asking for a review of old convictions based on, on innocence grounds. So that's been primary focus of Gaynor and my work is to look through these orders, reinvestigate them and, you know, uh, talk to and work with Howard, Craig, and the rest of their terrific team, well, Howard's gone now, but Craig and the rest of his terrific team on reanalyzing some of these cases. So that's that's been the focus, but the grant also did talk about the possibility of doing some systemic work together, which um, uh, we you know, welcomed that opportunity. Now, as both Howard and Craig said, when we, uh, when they brought us the draft Kurtzrock report, they had already reviewed these cases with a, I should say, really with a fine tooth comb. I mean, these cases had been pulled in 17 and reviewed, and then they had gone through the materials extremely carefully, get the files, deciding documents were in those files, not just locating those documents, but then figuring out what had been disclosed, what, you know, complicated process. You can't tell right away, you know, if, if the defendants in cases where defendants were saying, I had never seen this before. They were just looking at the cases uh, what what could you tell had been turned over? So we did not engage Gaynor and I in a reinvestigation of what documents were in the file, what documents had been turned over. We basically read the work that they had done where they said, this is what we found and this is what we decided to turn over. And then in some of those matters, they said, look, we've got some questions. There are some materials that we still have not turned over. Uh, because we don't see that these really do fall under uh, Brady. These just don't seem like Brady. And so we, you know, we haven't turned those things over yet. And Gaynor and I kind of went through all of that material and said, you know, you've got a, a, a prosecutor here who was playing, it isn't even fast and loose. He was breaking the rules for whatever reason he was breaking them. And we don't know what his mens rea really was, whether it was ego and, you know, whether he just enjoyed getting over on people or whether he had convinced himself with his interpretations of the rules and the judges were backing him up and he was enjoying that. I mean, who, who, who knows? But when you have a situation like that, and you've got somebody's behavior that has so undermined the credibility and the status in the community of the office, and you want to restore that, really, what's the downside of just disclosing everything? And then seeing what defense counsel, in most of these cases, there was going to be somebody who would be reviewing this material, but, you know, what they could make of it just seemed like that was the, the smart way to go. So, you know, it, we made that recommendation and we discussed that with them and they decided, oh, okay, you know, that makes sense, you know, let's go with that. We also did, you know, talk to them about, well, you know, what kinds of trainings are you going to be doing around this issue going forward? I mean, if you've got people in the office who are basically taking the position that we let the police decide what needs to be disclosed, or we let the police really take charge of the investigation and the prosecution of the case, what are, what are you going to be talking to people about? So we talked a little bit about the training. And as you can see also from another section of this report, they have done a considerable amount of training in the office on exactly these issues, you know, made particularly relevant and significant and important in New York now by the, the new discovery. So we no longer engage in some sort of complicated uh, analysis of what needs to be turned over and what doesn't need to be turned over. Things are going to get turned over, period. But the 
responsibility for making decisions and for deciding how to prosecute cases and which cases to prosecute certainly doesn't belong with the police. It belongs with the prosecutor's offices. And people should not, no matter how powerful and how um, you know, uh, determined these police officers are uh, to make their arrests stick. It is the prosecutors who have the professional and ethical responsibility to decide who gets charged with crimes. And all of those DAs, you know, should know that and, and, and will know that. Um, right. And, and uh, the other thing that we said, obviously, is that there will be some of these cases which, as a result of some of the disclosures, have now filed applications to be reviewed for innocence matters. And obviously, Gaynor and I will be looking at those cases with that um, in mind. Okay. I, I don't know if, if Gaynor, if I've sort of left anything out there that you, you think I ought to mention or stress. Okay. No, you summarized it. You summarized kind of, it perfectly. Yeah, kind of bring you in here too. Um, so I think those folks who are in innocence organizations or defense counsel are probably kind of curious, like why did you, did you decide this was a proper role for you as an innocence lawyer, as a defense lawyer, to join kind of join forces, if you will, with the prosecutors to do this review? Did you consider that there might be conflict issues or there might be ethical issues which would bar that? Like how did you work through those things together? Uh, well, we, cer we certainly thought about wh whether, you know, there would be issues or problems. I mean, we certainly thought about it, but obviously we thought that the, we were proud of the work that they had done. Okay. I mean, we've been proud of this collaboration and um, we were proud that they were doing a systemic look at the office. I mean, we don't know of other people that have done this. I mean, this is the kind of thing we sort of are all hoping that you know, uh, you know, CIB, CRUs will do. They won't just overturn individual cases. They will pull the lessons learned from those cases and do something with the lessons. Yes, training, but what else can be done? Right. So here, you know, here, our partners, we're actually doing the kinds of things that we would want other similar district attorney's offices to do. So, I mean, we weren't going to just rubber stamp it and we weren't also going to say, well, in order to sign this, we have to redo everything that you do. We, that seemed silly and we really value and uh, respect their work. Um, but we, you know, uh, did feel uh, very, very proud of their effort. And I think Gaynor, um, is that, was that a major factor for you guys in terms of the trust that you already had with the CIB because of the work that you had done together? And because this is a different, you know, kind of way of doing the business for traditional adversaries to be working together. Did that kind of play into um, what you were thinking, Gaynor, when you agreed to go along with it? Absolutely. And I mean, we've had a really positive relationship with the CIB. Um, on any case that we had follow-up questions on, we had a full discussion. We were given the material that was perhaps, you know, questionable material uh, that, you know, there was there was a question of whether or not it should be given over def to defense counsel. I mean, there's throughout this partnership, and 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 I came into the post-conviction innocence clinic um, specifically for this partnership grant. You know, Adele has been running it for a while, but I was hired specifically for the grant. And it's been a collaboration that's been completely open, transparent, um, beyond just, you know, working together on the Kurtz Rock Report. As Adele mentioned, one of our jobs in this grant is reviewing um, applications that come into the CIB. And I think one of the things that, have, that you know, a lesson to take away and from this partnership and what's made it so successful so far is that, um, you know, anything that we've, you know, asked to look at or, you know, inquired about further information um, has been, you know, given to us with, you know, no, no pushback as, as it should be, but it's really been a, a joint effort. So uh, that, that's one of, you know, for me, one of the high level takeaways as well. And that continued into the collaboration on the Kurtz Rock Report. And Craig and Howard, you mentioned that you knew, I think Howard, you said earlier that you knew early on you wanted to get the post-conviction innocence clinic involved. Um, I guess kind of the same question for you, was it because of this existing trust that you had with them? Like what was it about 
the relationship that you had that said we, we want them as a partner we're not just going to do this ourselves well yeah i it was actually i think part of our grant application that we would take a look potentially at at uh, kurtz rock and involve the the clinic in that effort um i think uh, one of i'll let adele speak to this but one of the in, one of the reasons why we thought you know there was a compelling argument for a, a partnership grant in our county was that there was this history that led to you know the the uh, resignation the, the indictment of the da and then the wrongful conviction of uh, the clinic's client um there, those are signs of some more systemic problems that uh that may have been present in the criminal justice system and it was an opportunity to look into it not just in individual cases, but uh, but bigger issues and, and broader issues. So that was one of the reasons why we wanted you know uh, wanted them to be involved in the Kurtz Rock review, which was one aspect of the systemic problem here. A you know a prosecutor who was involved in many of the high profile cases of the office. And I think that um, it probably bears mentioning here that there's been significant turnover at. The head of the office, right? From as you mentioned, Craig, that the prior district attorney had to step down. There was a new election with Mr. Sini coming in, and I apologize. I think I misgendered him earlier, so my apologies on that. Um, but of course, the political reality also is that Sini lost his re-election bid, and now there's a new office. So I guess my next question, in terms of, and this is probably at Craig, Ms. Howard, you've left the office, but Craig, do you have concerns if you're comfortable talking about this? Um, that this kind of work continue under a different administration when it was really the prior that gave you so much kind of free reign to be able to do that. Of course, there's concerns. I mean, you, you'd be like to say there weren't any concerns. And actually, I, I've discussed this pretty openly with Howard and with uh, the clinic. Um, however, I think the nature of, uh, of society as a whole um, and of the, the nature of being a district attorney um, requires that this bureau in some form goes on. Um, so I'm not really concerned that the, the, the work will go on. My concern is, and again, this isn't based upon anything because my first uh, bureau chief's meeting is next week where I'm putting together spreadsheets and justifying our existence at this point. Um, it hasn't happened yet. But right, it's more the pri what priority this bureau has, what where we stand in of a new administration. Um, whereas uh, the ACD basically campaigned on, on doing exactly this. You know, whether it was this specific bureau or not, it was basically turning around um, the 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 image of our office and doing that through through very very proactive measures. Um, and whether or not this current administration follows that. That model is in question. So yes, of course, there's concern. Um, but as I said, I don't think politically, I don't think you can do away with this, especially once it's already in existence. And it, it has been extremely high profile. I, I mean, Howard left three weeks ago, and I've literally gotten two calls from people that are trying to set up conviction integrity units, one in upstate New York and one, I can't remember, somewhere out of state seeking our advice because they've heard things about the Suffolk County, you know, Conviction Integrity Bureau. So, I mean, it's, it's too, it's too present to have for it to go away, to, you know, go into the darkness. So I think we're and, okay. And I don't of course, the public nature of the report itself, you know, going back to the constituency with information that is helpful for them, that probably plays into it as well, I would think. So there's a question in the chat about balancing, and I think this is, probably more for Howard, balancing about um, how to balance this kind of audit work with ongoing work of the Bureau, that you have cases, obviously, that you're investigating um, at the same time as conducting this kind of audit. Um, did you, how did you balance that in terms of the goals that you were pursuing? I think, Kelly, I put that right. I'm, I'm just smiling because, I mean, Howard and I, it, we have a no alcohol policy in the office. And we would, have, we would have broken up, open a bottle once we did the Kurtz Rock report because this is something we were definitely lamenting the whole time is it did, it took an enormous amount of time and effort. Um, and we, our efforts were definitely concentrated on that. And 
we've spoken a little about this, me, Marissa, Adele, about the fact that if you were to do this audit, if, if Howard had allowed me to, to go down the rabbit hole, basically all I would have ever done for the next four years of my life has been reviewing cases of every person who ever touched Glenn Kurtzrock, supervised Glenn Kurtzrock, assisted him on a case. So it is enormous, enormous amount of work. And the only thing I can say is, you know, we started from, from, a, from a definite point. We started with the prior eight reviews and went from there. We, we developed, and I say we, it was Howard, that really was the organization behind it. I'm not the organization guy, Howard definitely is. I mean, if I turn my camera, you'd see the organization in this office, but it's just, it is developing a plan, developing an outline of what exactly it is you're looking for, finding those things in the cases. And if it's somebody that handled hundreds of cases, you got to take 10, the 10 most significant cases, check those out and see if they lead you into those other avenues uh, more than anything else. Because listen, if it is somebody that you're, you're concerned with, if you have a concern, then there's a reason for concern. And I think you have to explore it no matter what the main hours are. Howard, did you want to add to that? No, I think that Craig accurately represented. I mean, it's, it's just a, it is a significant undertaking and you know, I, I actually was was part of uh, the transition team for Alvin Bragg, uh, the new Manhattan DA, and on a subcommittee and looking at conviction integrity. And I will say that, you know, so others who were part of the transition team, and I, I won't name names or betray confidences, but uh, there was a lot of interest in doing a whole host of systemic reviews. I think, um, you know, there's I, part of part of what I was doing is saying, well, you know. First of all, if you do, if you, you you have to figure out how to balance that with applications that come in, and second, you know they can be all consuming. If you're talking about, and this is a campaign statement that Alvin Bragg made publicly, if you're looking at all of Linda Fairstein's cases that she that she handled, she was the head supervisor of uh, the sex crimes unit in the Manhattan DA's office for decades. Um, you know, are you looking just at cases she supervised, cases there where she made appearances, cases where she tried it? You know, you really have to figure out how to scope it properly because otherwise it will take over everything. And again, if you're doing an audit, you're you're not necessarily if you're spending your time doing an audit, you're not necessarily getting to the applications of people who are sitting in jail who might be innocent. Um, so there's a real, you know, uh, I think balancing. That has to be done. It's it's work that need that had to be done for the reasons we discussed, um, and we had to complete it. But um, you know, we have to think just for conviction integrity units and and uh, advocates. It's just something to think about because there is it with of course more resources can and should be allocated to this, these efforts, but there's always a limitation on resources. Right, and um, we just have about. 10 minutes or so left and there's another question in the chat that I don't want to get to in a bit questions about red flags and, and what people should be looking out for but I see that Kia um, also had some questions she wanted to ask. Um, that's kind of what what I wanted to pivot to um, more and sort of uh, lessons learned uh, for, for other fo folks who are considering uh, strongly considering uh, doing an audit and thinking about um, you know the parameters of it and how it should be run i guess if if maybe craig and howard could each you know give a few bullet points of of you know important lessons you'd want to impart you know to other folks who are looking to do this similar work well actually i i i would actually refer this to adele because i think she had an idea for maybe how to do do something that is less than a full audit but that allows for red flagging of applications as they come in and and that may you know i don't know if it's quite a middle ground but it's a way to sort of infuse some of this thinking uh and some of the work that we did into you know the i guess i would say the core work of a conviction integrity bureau which is to review individual convictions yeah and i'm gonna of course take that bouncing ball and send it over to gainer because i think if what you're talking about is kind of like if, if we notice something about a particular officer in a particular case then perhaps that could be a red flag is that what we're thinking and gainer why don't yeah. you take that sure yeah. yeah i mean we we've spoken about setting up a system to you know track um 
potential red flags. So for example, you know, every CIB application that comes in, setting up a chart that notes the name of the applicant, um, obviously the name of the applicant, the indictment, the nature of the claim, but also the precinct involved, the police officer involved, the prosecutor involved. And maybe you would find in that case, okay, you know, there's not a colorable claim of actual innocence here. And from the review, we don't, you know, see a Brady or Giglio violation, but there was an allegation that, for example, you know, the officer planted the, the weapon on, on the applicant. I think just even setting up a tracking system where, let's say, another application down the road comes in and is flagging that same officer or flagging that um, mentioning that same prosecutor again who was involved in the case. And I think that setting up a system like that, um, a system that obviously you can easily search through. Um, I know Marissa, you mentioned not, you said not, you know, every DA office has a system set up where they could search for what prosecutor tried the case. Okay, but setting up a system like that in the CIB where you can easily um, search terms. So I think that, you know, as Howard and Craig said, yes, it's an incredible time consuming um, project to audit, you know, prosecutors cases or audit police officers cases. So if you can't do that um, on a consistent basis, then I think you have to, you know, take a forward thinking approach of setting up a system that tracks people, conduct issues. Um, and then if it, you know, whatever your threshold is, if it triggers, maybe maybe if you see it enough time, it would trigger a systemic review for that prosecutor's cases or that police officer's cases. Um, one other thing I wanted to just say though, is that, you know, along those lines, I don't think that, um, I do think that there is also the effect of, with a report like this, you know, of, a, of the deterrent component as well. I mean, it's that saying, no one wants to end up in the New York Post, no one wants to be Glenn Kurtzrock and have a report written on them. So even if it doesn't turn into an audit of, you know, all the prosecutor's cases in the Homicide Bureau, I do think, in my opinion, and I don't think I'm being too optimistic here, um, that there is a, a deterrent component here of people, you know, thinking twice before they do something. And yeah, I mean, in terms, of, in terms of setting up red flags, I mean, remember, for example, that's what really started all the Scarcella reversals in uh, Brooklyn, when they started noticing, wait a second, how could this informer possibly have, have seen as many homicides as this informer apparently saw, because in every case he was using the same informer. So because they were able to see what witnesses had testified in which cases across the Homicide Bureau, they were able to see these unbelievable coincidences, which then turned into being able to take a general look at that work. But without having had that ability to track the witnesses, they wouldn't have seen that. Right, and I will kind of say that we work, we at the Quattrone Center do, have been working with a number of DA's offices around the country to develop that tracking system. Um, both in terms of the inform information that might lead to flaggish cases, but also for tracking process so that you can report back to your uh, funding agency of how good you are and how good you are at processing cases. And I see Sarah Simone, who's on the call in Massachusetts, has really taken a strong lead on helping to kind of think about some of those data points. And of course, Val Newman at Wayne County, who I think is also on the call, they've done a, a tremendous amount of work in these areas, because we have to think about data, not just in terms of case management, but also looking for those trends and looking for opportunities to dive down deeper. Exactly, I think Dana, as you were just talking about, it, without the data, you can't know where, where that is and where they're coming from um, uh, on terms of that. So I there was a question, which I think kind of, Dana, I like the point that you made about the deterrent factor. And there was a question in the chat, which I'm gonna throw back to Howard and to Craig, which was, you know, is that really true? Does this serve as a deterrent factor or were the current DAs, did they kind of resent the report or did they push back against the report? What was the response within the office when the report's coming out or even the, the work that you were doing in general? Well, in regard to the Kurtz Rock report, uh, I mean, Glenn didn't have a whole lot of friends remaining in the office, uh, honestly, I mean, he, he had, in their opinion, brought embarrassment upon the office. A and the fact of the matter is whether he brought embarrassment to the office because he got caught 
or because you know nobody else acted like this, you know, we can debate that. Uh, but there wasn't a lot of you know pushback on us in regard to Kurtrock um, and that report. Some people, you know, made a little fun for piling on. You know, the guy's been through so much. He's got a wife. He's got two kids. He's got a house. What's the point of this? And, and I think that you know obviously misses the point of a lot of other people who might have had wives and kids and uh, went through things they sh shouldn't have gone through because of. Uh, for lack of a better term, cheating uh, within the system. So there wasn't a whole lot of, of outward hostility towards it, but I, th I think there was definitely some concern about it. And as Gainer, I, I think Gainer's right in that there definitely is a deterrent factor. Um, but there's a lot of things that have happened over the past four years. Um, one of them is when Mr. Cini came in, before the new rules went into effect, he basically seeing what had happened gave everybody, for lack of a better term, uh, an order, just turn everything over. You know, stop playing games. This isn't gamesmanship. This is justice. Just turn everything over and try your case. And then once the new rules came into effect uh, in New York in regard to discovery rules and such, uh, just about everything should be getting turned over. And the things that are necessary to turn over are turned over. Uh, they, the attorneys in the office are concerned and have reason to be concerned and have this as an example of what happens if you become unconcerned with you know, fulfilling your duties. So they are more likely to err on the side of turning things over now than they were at any time prior to Kurt Schrock or prior to the support and definitely prior to the new statute. Um, you know, the, the police are a different story. Um, you know, we are the, we have been referred to as the rat squad of the DA's office and such and I, you know, Luckily, I, I don't really care about that. Um, I, I kind of find it amusing. Um, and I tell everybody, I tell every, again, for 14 years, I was a defense attorney. In, in that 14 years, I did 12 homicide trials in Suffolk County. I had a very good relationship with the detectives. I mean, they were fine when they were winning 90% of their trials against me. But I come here, and when they found out the bureau that I'm running, some of them do not speak to me anymore. And in my mind, that means those are the guys who, when their names show up, they're the ones I should be taking a closer look at. And the ones that congratulated me and shook my hand, again, I'm still going to look at them because they could just be really good at it. But I mean, those are the guys that probably don't have anything to worry about. And that's the way it's interpreted. And, I, and with the DAs, because we've gotten, for the most part, positive responses, I do think that most of them at least believe that they're doing the job the right way. Uh -huh. So you know, that's been my impression. That's, and I will also kind of uh, neglected to mention before when we're talking about kind of red flags and how to find red flags. Some offices do very carefully track appellate court opinions that come down when there's an allegation of prosecutorial misconduct, which is either found or at least raises some concerns. They go pull that case, you know, find out who the prosecutor is if they're not named, which usually they're not, um, and then kind of do an independent investigation on their own. So that's kind of another track for trying to look for these types of cases is to just follow the appellate court opinions as they're being released. And I kind of see that there are a number of folks on the call today who are from state attorneys general offices. Um, those also are probably great resources to be able to collaborate with when trying to look at trying to do some kind of an audit of this nature and of this scope um, going on, because it's not a small undertaking, as you're saying, Howard, it is quite something. So we're nearing the end of the our time together just want to uh, encourage if folks have questions left over to please put them in the chat or raise your hand using the Zoom function so we can um, acknowledge that. But I kind of want to go backwards if I can, starting with Gaynor and Adele. Um, you know, what are your takeaways from this, what you, either for Suffolk County or for broader? Are these kinds of audits worth doing? Are they worth the resources? Should you um, kind of adopt this as a regular practice? Or, or what would you recommend, certainly for the innocence organizations who are on, of how to approach or partner with a district attorney's office about doing these kinds of reviews. I, I guess Gainer first, if you don't mind, and then toss to Adele. I guess my takeaway is in an ideal world, every CRU, CIB would have a partnership <laughs> with a clinic um, because there is so much work and because manpower, woman power is an issue. Um, so that's one takeaway. And then the other takeaway, and um, you know, I'm, I'm new to the post-conviction work uh, prior to joining the clinic. I was um, 
a defense attorney, trial attorney for 10 years of legal aid. So now coming into this work, you know, I see um, how long it takes. And I also can, you know, imagine what the what the process would be if you didn't have the acts, the process of reviewing a case or advocating for a client would be if you didn't have the access to information the way that we do because of the partnership. So really just the 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 tremendous benefit of, you know, from our end, looking at a case, having questions, and then being able to say to the CIB, hey, can I, you know, can you pull this file from, you know, appeals? Could you help us get this, you know, police report so we can answer the questions that we have instead of spending time, time where people are either sitting in jail or they can't move on with their life, um, waiting to get information that could easily be assessed be turned over. So I think for me, the biggest takeaway in this partnership so far, having being new to this, coming into this relationship, um, into this work is just the tremendous benefit of transparency and being able to have access to information. Great. And just, uh, Ada, I'm sorry to interrupt, but just before you, you give the same, uh, answer the same question, I'm going to go ahead and put in the chat again, a copy of the report for those who didn't get it when you first logged on. Um, and also I'm launching the uh, post meeting evaluation poll, please don't you know, take focus away from the folks who are presenting for that. Um, but we do need that for the purposes for BJ. So Adele, I'm sorry, would you? Oh, no, that's okay. I was going to say you could also put our uh, contacts in the chat if you wanted to, because oh, okay. we'll have okay. follow up questions about what it was like or how's the partnership, you know, we're getting about if it's going to be kind of applications, you know, will, will, will be helpful for that. But I, I would say something else, since so many of the offices have conviction integrity units, um, some of them are on this call and people I know, um, it's not all like this. So this, this relationship has been a little bit special and I think it's actually just brought untoward benefits uh, in multiple different ways. First of all, it's great as an educational tool. What's the difference between the client and looking at the matter where you're, you're, represent, you're looking at it with the prosecutor's head, right? Why is it any different? Is it any different? What's different about this, right? What can we learn looking at it in both ways in our clinic? The other thing is that I, I have brought cases to CI use, and it's not always a collaborative experience. Sometimes it's not really all that different from going to court, except that you obviously don't have the information to uh, convince your judge to vacate the conviction. So you're making a presentation and then sort of leaving it up to them to kind of do the work and get back to you with how they think about your case, as opposed to this, which has really been a kind of a sit down and let's see if we can get to the bottom of this. Let's see if we can figure out what's really happened. Should we hire this expert? Does that make sense? How should we do that? How should we go about doing an investigation? Are you going to come with us? Is that going to bother this witness? If law enforcement is trailing around or sitting in the car, are we going to be able to get the same information? How do we make those decisions as being a partner? All of a sudden, I got an echo. I apologize. Um, 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 it happened. <laughs> um, Howard, Craig? I wanted to make that, that okay. there's, we've learned how best to do this, and, and I'd like to be able to that out to more people in some way. Awesome. Craig, uh, Howard, last words for you guys in terms of your I make Howard work. go last here, just because I'm going to say when I came in, the PCIC was already involved, in it, and I didn't know you know, how do you, I actually am a New York law school grad. I'm familiar with the school. Uh, I actually love the school and love everything about it, but I wasn't sure how it was going to go with a bunch of students working on these cases. And after our first meeting with, with Adele and Gaynor and the first group of students I dealt with, I was amazed. Um, I mean, the, the level of enthusiasm that they, they bring to the investigation is enormous. The, the amount of work and the quality of the work that they do was was shocking to me and what's more shocking to me is that there's been two more classes since then and each one of them have maintained that level of excellence and enthusiasm i just printed out was going through some 
materials on the most recent case they're reviewing and the thoroughness of it is, is just outstanding. Working with the post-conviction innocence clinic, I think it is important for us. And again, I know everyone can't do it, but if you can take advantage of it, you should because ours, my letterhead, at the top of my letterhead, it still says Suffolk County District Attorney's Office. So working with the post-conviction innocence clinic brings a degree of legitimacy to any of our findings, and especially when we find against an application that there is no action. And Adele has already done her review with her class or with Gain or whatever way, and they're joining with us in that application. It just brings such a degree of legitimacy th to it where they know that it's not just us, you know, rejecting applications, going through them, tossing them aside. And the fact that we agree probably on 90% of everything um, is it, just, it, it gives you a level of confidence what you're doing. And the 10% that we don't agree on is the most fun out of anything that you do because there are, there's me and Howard who have such, we have very diverse backgrounds, but not, not less diverse than me and Adele or me and Gaynor um, and Dara who was working with us, and Dan who's working with and all of their students and, and their upbringings and the experience they bring to things. I mean, it's just, for lack of a better term, I sound like an old man, I say it's a blast. It's just such a blast. To, to deal with this and collaborate with them on these cases um, that that I I could never imagine doing it in the absence of the PCIC. And I'm just glad I came in with the PCIC involved. Thanks, Chris. And Howard, for you, last last takeaway. Um, I don't know. I don't think I can um, can top uh, that ringing endorsement, but I, I, I would just say, you know, I would encourage um, others uh, that are thinking about this, um, both conviction integrity uh, bureaus and uh, innocence organizations, that there are benefits to partnering. And, you know, it can be a limited uh, scope partnership, maybe on a particular review of a systemic review or on a particular class of cases, um, or it can be broader. I don't know if the federal grants uh, that were available are any longer available to support this. Um, Adele is shaking her head no. Um, so that's that's unfortunate. Um, but I think it's it it is valuable even without uh, the federal funding. Um, and it's something that's worth worth pursuing and and continuing for its own sake. Howard, thank you, Craig. Thank you, Adele Gaynor. Thank you all so much. Uh, for being a part of this today. And thank you everyone for joining on and for your questions. I think they'll hang out for a couple more minutes to see um, you know, if there are any additional questions. Just want to remind people that we do this every month. Next month in February, we'll be bringing back the folks from Healing Justice, which is a nationwide organization that works with victims, crime victims in post-conviction um, issues. And they're going to be coming back to talk to us about best practices for working with victims and how to involve them or at least keep them informed of post-conviction investigations as they're ongoing. So thank you for everyone. We're so glad to see everybody um, and hopefully we will see you next month. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you.